Good morning to the East Coast, the West Coast, and our friends around the world. Uh, we're excited for another session of the ASMBS Fellow Project, hoping to provide high quality content for fellows around the world, um, as well as any faculty or friends who wish to join. We are really excited today. We're going to be busting some bariatric myths, and we are joined by Drs. Nova Zoka and Sarah Samreen. Dr. Nova Zoka is an associate professor of surgery at West Virginia University in Morganton, West Virginia. Her education includes a medical degree from UC Davis School of Medicine, general surgery residency at the University of New Mexico, and fellowship in advanced minimally invasive bariatric surgery at Duke University. Dr. Zoka <laughs> performs bariatric and metabolic and foregut surgery using minimally invasive laparoscopic and robotic techniques. Her research interests include obesity and bariatric outcomes, healthcare disparities. Uh, Dr. Zoka is also the founder of Endolumic, a company developing fluorescence guided surgical tools. Very cool. Thank you, Nova, for joining us. Dr. Sarah Samarine has earned her Bachelor of Medicine, Bachelor of Surgery from the Aga Khan University Medical College in Karachi. She completed her internship in general surgery at Berkshire Medical Center in Berkshire, Massachusetts, and completed her residency in general surgery at the Geisinger Medical Center in Danville, Pennsylvania, where she was an administrative chief resident. She accomplished her fellowship in advanced GI minimally invasive and bariatric surgery at the University of Nebraska Medical Center in Omaha, Nebraska. She is currently the surgery clerkship co-director and the director of metabolic and bariatric surgery in the Department of Surgery at the University of Texas Medical Branch in Galveston, Texas. Ladies, thank you so much for joining us. I'm going to try and give you the full time, so take it away. All right. Thank you, Dr. Jane Spangler and Eckhouse and ASMBS. Uh, we're really thrilled to be presenting today um, on a topic near and dear to our hearts. Okay, sharing the screen. Um, so uh, short version is, I feel like there are a lot of myths around obesity, weight loss, and then bariatric surgery that just get perpetuated, whether it's through, um, you know, the healthcare system or just the interwebs. And I really wanted to do a talk that uh, started to break these things down. Now, uh, be forewarned, there's a lot of data and information on these slides. We're really trying to tell a story with this talk. So um, I would encourage everyone, if you're interested, you know, go back and read all of these papers. We're not going to, you know, go down to the itty bitty of like the P value of every single thing, but it's there. Um, so the following are disclosures. So just listen along and enjoy the content. Um, obviously, a lot of we are, you know, standing on the backs of giants, all the scientists and surgeons who developed this. So these are disclosures. So we're going to break down these eight myths. The first four around obesity, I will talk about those. The second four about bariatric surgery, Dr. Samreen will cover those. Um, so without further ado, so obesity is caused by lack of willpower, uh, laziness, refusal to eat less and move more. Um, no. So basically, obesity is really complex. We still don't fully understand it. This is the most simple diagram I could create saying that it's a multifactorial condition. It involves not only genetics, hormonal uh, milieu, the behavior, and of course, our environment. And so this is a quick look at all the genes associated with obesity. And you have monogenetic obesity, meaning one gene is contributing to those, uh, you know, that trait versus polygenetic obesity. And, you know, there's huge amounts of research going in to see how these all interplay. There's also epigenetics, meaning our behaviors impact what genes turn on and off. And, um, you know, there's no simple one tweak we can do to cure obesity. Um, furthermore, as the body gains weight, we get more volume of adipose tissue and what I like to tell people is adipose tissue is basically its own endocrine organ. And so in addition to just storing energy, it also makes a lot of chemicals, um, cytokines, uh, interleukins, all these uh, factors that can act either locally or distantly on the body. Um, so this is just a list of all the adipose cytokines that are secreted from uh, white fat. And we know a lot of these things are inflammatory, and we'll get to that more uh, shortly. So when we talk about appetite, 
really it's an interaction between the the brain and the GI tract. And so uh, it's regulated within the hypothalamus. So that means, you know, that adipose tissue, that endocrine organ is secreting, uh, for example, leptin, uh, the satiety hormone, the stomach secretes ghrelin, the hunger hormone, the, the the pancreas is secreting insulin. And those three factors, along with everything else, uh, goes up into the brain, into the hypothalamus and causes changes. So uh, this is, again, just not a one thing like, oh, uh, for people who had leptin deficiency, the, the monogenetic obesity, they said, you know, what if we just give them leptin? Uh, it didn't always cure the condition. So it's challenging. So when we talk about this adipose tissue secreting inflammatory chemicals, we're starting to see that, you know, it causes more inflammation in the body, putting people at risk for uh, arthritis and joint inflammation, also cancers. And so we're seeing more and more associations between people with obesity and having increased cancer risk. The big ones, you know, we want to hit on is definitely for women, endometrium, ovaries, and cervix. Um, there's a huge uh, increased risk in women with obesity for those type of cancers, but we also see it in all the other cancers. So breast, colon, prostate, and, you know, still the, the jury is out in terms of what's the mechanism. Is it the inflammation caused by all the, the adipose cytokines? Is it the fact that uh, adipose tissue increase, uh, in produces more estrogen, or is it just around insulin and those chemicals that are leading to that risk? Pardon me. <clears throat> and so this is a true diagram about all the complexities of obesity. What I like uh, is it really breaks it down in, into factors inside the person versus outside the person. So the main ones I want to hit on is... Uh, in utero. So uh, mothers pass on to the baby different factors that can increase their risk of obesity. There's a study that looked at women who had their first child before bariatric surgery and the second child after bariatric surgery when they were at a lower weight. And what they found was that second child had less risk of obesity than the first. Um, also, again, you know, we're getting all our genes from our parents. So there's a the genetic factor. There's also the gut microbiome, and we'll kind of touch on that further in the next point, but uh, the different balance of gut bacteria affects how we absorb energy from our food. There's more and more understanding about bile acids and nutrients sensing in the duodenum. So these are kind of all things inside. And then there's also kind of emotional eating. So people who eat with stress um, or, uh, you know, just sort of more uh, addictive eating behaviors um, that can contribute. Uh, we know that trauma can affect obesity as well. And then outside the person, I can't harp on this more. And I feel like the, the one area of this talk um, we could, it, it would be nice to talk more about, but I didn't want to pack too much in is just our obesogenic environment. So um, number one, uh, we are living in a, in a jungle filled with dangerous animals uh, poison animals everywhere we go. So when you go into the supermarket, you really need to think that you're in a dangerous environment. Um, all of the nutrient dense, high energy foods are really not that good for us. Um, even when people come to my clinic and they say, Hey, I'm eating a protein, two protein shakes a day, and then a protein bar. I'm like, that's okay. But really it's better to just eat real food. Meaning uh, when you look at, when you get something, there's only one ingredient in it. Um, you know, you're not having the package with all those ingredients. We know that ultra processed food, um, is, is not great for the body. And then, you know, again, all these environmental toxins is the fact that there's probably microplastic in this water that I'm drinking, increasing my risk, probably. Um, and then, uh, you know, uh, what else can we say about environment? Well, that's okay. Let's keep going. So bottom line, we know obesity is a chronic disease. And, and this you know, statement became stronger in 2014 when uh, the American Medical Association finally said, this is uh, not something that is a person's fault. It is a chronic disease. Um, 
And another challenge with obesity is there's just a huge amount of weight bias, I mean, people judging people for having obesity. So we know uh, the majority of people with obesity, 40% of the U.S. adults experience weight stigma. So meaning not getting the same opportunities at work, in school, for pay, um, uh, affects a lot of these people. It can lead them to e continuing maladaptive eating or even you know, having stress, mental health issues. Um, and I, you know, really encourage everyone to avoid this tough love approach when you talk with people about their weight, because a lot of people say, well, uh, my PCP or someone provider said, uh, you know, hey, you're overweight. Can we take the last one minute of our visit to talk about your weight? And, you know, just just go do diet and exercise or just get on a treadmill I mean, first of all, no, uh, getting on a treadmill probably won't fix obesity. Um, so really trying to uh, be kind when you're working with patients and understand this is something, you know, they're living with every day and, you know, offering them tools. Even as a general surgeon, I have uh, fl floundered in this in the past where I, maybe I took out someone's gallbladder, they come in for a post-op check and they have obesity. And I say, hey, you know, you know, you're also a candidate for bariatric surgery and they're offended. So I think it's good if you want to talk about weight with a patient to ask permission first, like, you know, I, something I could have said better for that patient is, you know, I also do bariatric surgery. Um, you know, could we talk about, you know, weight management tools or are you interested before just jumping in and assuming everyone with obesity wants bariatric surgery? So just truth number one, obesity is a a complex, chronic, multi, multi metabolic disease with a multifactorial etiology. So number two, calories in equals calories out. Um, this is the idea that what we eat equals our total energy exposure, and it's the same no matter what you eat, which is not true. So some of the challenges of this are there are no perfect way to count calories. We know that nutrition information panels sometimes have up to 20% discrepancy with the calories in the food versus what they're stating. There's a good study from Australia, if you can see the references that confirm that. Metabolic rate varies based on, you know, the tissues in your body, whether they be muscle, fat, um, water. And so uh, it's difficult to gauge that metabolic rate. It also changes based on dieting, which we'll see soon. And then different calorie sources definitely have different effects on our body. So first we'll start with a simple example. Let's say these nuts, uh, you know, uh, eating almonds versus eating the same amount of pizza. Well, number one, apparently that brown coating on the outside of the almonds is hard to digest. So we actually can't digest 20% of those calories because of that. Uh, also, these uh, almonds have fiber. So when we eat them, we're going to stay full a little longer and the fat will, you know, cause some uh, satiety. Versus the pizza, it's very delicious. Our body will uh, digest 100% of those calories. And, you know, the flour and stuff like that, the glycemic index is going to be higher. Again, you could say, oh, you have the cheese and the meat to offset it. But again, uh, it's not going to be as uh, like satiety provoking as the nuts. Another example I share with my patients is just these different yogurts, right? Bariatric surgery, we tell people about Greek yogurt every day, but they're not all created equal. So, uh, you know, they're both peach yogurt. You say, great. You look at them, there's a difference of 30 calories between them. We look at the Yoplait, it only has five grams of protein and 14 grams of added sugar. That's one third of your sugar for the day in this little cup. Whereas the Chobani has you know, 12 grams of protein, only five grams of sugar. So what we know is the protein in that Chobani is going to, uh, you know, make people feel fuller longer and less sugar. It's not going to burn as fast. When we, we know that the American population since about at least the past 20 years eats about 200 extra calories a day. And I personally think if everyone is eating processed food and we know there's these added sugars in each each food. So let's say between these two, there's about a 30 calorie discrepancy. If you are eating, you know, five to six processed food items, there's going to be these 30 grams. And that's about that extra 200 calories. So going back to why it's so important to just eat real food. Um, this is a wonderful slide. Um, we know that 
uh, the duodenum senses nutrients and releases hormones uh, based on different foods. So going back to kind of the difference between the almonds and the pizza, uh, this uh, shows how the nutrients uh, in the duodenum, it says, are they fats? Are they carbs? Are they protein? And what happens? Uh, and what we know is that in obesity or a high fat, oh dear, high fat diet, um, these pathways are affected for both the fat and the carbohydrate sensing. Obesity uh, interferes with, with some of these processes. Um, so again, kind of just reiterating how much this disease is a metabolic process. Um, more, so the microbiome. Um, what we know is that uh, the microbiome is different between people who do and do not have obesity. Um, what we know is that in a meta-analysis, there's a lower Shannon index, which looks at the diversity of the microbiome in people with obesity versus uh, not with, without. Um, and we know that there's a higher firmicutes to bacteroides ratio in people who have obesity. Um, and what we know about this is actually the, the, the bacteria in our uh, gut helps us absorb calories from the food and that people with obesity, their bacterial balance actually allows them to absorb more calories from the food than someone without. So again, you could give two people the same hamburger, the person with obesity based on their biome is going to absorb more of those calories and it's really not fair, right? So truth number two, nutrient sensing, microbiome, diversity, uh, all these things affect calories absorbed in the GI tract. So calories in does not equal calories out all the time. Our, the foods we eat can affect that. So myth number three, this is my favorite one, exercise is the best way to lose weight. No, 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 no. So does exercise help with weight loss? This is a nice study. It was done in a Scandinavian country. So they probably have less obesity than us, but they did a randomized controlled trial um, with 100 men, 100 women. Uh, they basically exercised for over 300 minutes a week. And at one year, the men reduced the weight by four pounds, the women reduced the weight by three pounds. Um, why? So this is why. So, you know, when you exercise, or at least when I exercise, uh, an old person in my 40s exercising on my Peloton, yes, I am a cliche, um, I'm working out for 45 minutes and I'm probably burning about 150 calories, right? So that can be obviated and go away completely by this one cake pop. And uh, I just trashed my calorie benefit for my workout. So that's number one. Um, number two, and let me see if I can hide this. Uh, number two, they actually looked at the biggest loser. And this is a great study looking at metabolic rate for the biggest user. They looked at their baseline. Let me see if I have a nice little thing here. Oh, here we go. They, they looked kind of at their, their baseline weight. So let's just say pre-competition BMI 49 at week six of the competition, 43, week 30 of the competition, 30, and then six years after 43. So what's going on? So let's look at their metabolic rate. So again, resting, you know, uh, metabolic rate, and we can look at either the resting or the total. Let's just look at the total. So 38, um, you know, 3,800. Uh, when you're working out for the first six weeks, look, you're ramping up your metabolism. So when you start working out, you're getting a huge increase in your metabolism. But as you continue working out, look at this, by week 30, their metabolism had dropped down to below where they started. And why is this so detrimental? Because now their metabolism is actually lower than in the beginning. When they stop working out, if you're eating the same amount you did, you're still going to gain weight. Uh, so, you know, that's sort of the challenge. When, when we look at working out, yes, it ramps up our body for about six weeks, and then our bodies just adjust. And so we, we get back here, and at six years after the competition, their, their metabolism is still lower than when it was at the beginning. So this metabolism stays low, and we think about kind of 
all the challenges people have with losing weight, but then gaining back more, this explains a lot of it. So again, exercise is a great way to lose, to pardon me, maintain weight. It's great for mental health, but it is not good for weight loss. Okay, myth number four, dieting is the best way to lose weight. Uh, so this is a this is a picture of the Cheddar Man. It is the first inhabitant of uh, Great Britain. Um, this person lived around 10,000 years ago. It's the oldest complete skeleton of our species, Homo sapiens. So what's interesting is some people say, hey, what would the first Homo sapien look like? Well, guess what? If we put him in a suit and a tie, he would look just like us. And so when we when we ask, hey, how do our bodies work compared to the first Homo sapien? Our bodies work exactly the same as theirs. So what I would say is when the body is rapidly losing weight in this in Cheddar Man's culture or in our our culture, even our brain right now, when the body's rapidly losing weight 10,000 years ago, uh, the person was either had cancer or they were starving. And so Cheddar Man's brain, including our brain, when the body rapidly loses weight, uh, the brain tries to stop it. And what it does is by decreasing energy, expo energy expenditure, just what we saw on that uh, Biggest Loser slide, it's gonna drop your energy exposure when you're losing that much weight, and then it's gonna increase your hormone signals to be hungrier. So um, let's see, this study basically looked at uh, seven uh, triplets of, of subjects. The control subject was at their usual weight. There was one subject who lost um, about 10% uh, of their weight recently, and then a person who lost 10% of their weight and then maintained that for a year. And what they found was that the metabolic rate for the people who had either recently lost weight or lost weight a year ago was still lower. So what that's saying again is similar to what we're seeing in the in the Biggest Loser is that when people diet, uh, you know, recently, so the their metabolic rate stays low from five to eight weeks to a year later. So when you hear people say, "I was on a diet, I lost weight, but then I felt really hungry." and then I gained more than I had lost, it's because, again, their metabolic rate is lower after the diet. So if you go back to eating the same amount, you're going to gain weight. Um, let's see. This is also another uh, study that looked at this long-term effect of dieting. So 50 subjects were given 500 calorie a day diet. They lost 30 pounds. Then they were just placed on kind of a general average low carb, low fat diet and 30 minutes exercise daily. They measured their hunger hormones um, uh, at about a year, 62 weeks, and they were elevated. So that means the ghrelin is elevated um, and their weight regain uh, was about 17 pounds. And uh, even at that point, the ghrelin and hunger hormones remained elevated. So when you diet, it eventually will cause the hunger hormones to decrease. Let's just look again at the cheddar man brain. That is our brain. Rapidly losing weight is a danger signal to our brain and it tells people uh, to try and eat more. So this kind of goes back to the set point theory. Um, it's hard to find perfect data on this, but my thought is it's kind of combining the things we're talking about, the problems with diet and exercise for weight loss. This idea that the body is sort of at the brain decides the weight it wants to be at, and it's hard to shift that. Um, and uh, this can be challenging. So we know that dieting causes the metabolic rate to decrease. It causes hunger hormones to increase. And we know that about 80% of individuals eventually regain the weight they lose through dieting. So again, you know, just to kind of hammer this point home, we go on a diet. Our metabolism will slow down. Uh, to try and prevent us from losing weight. We end the diet and maybe go back to what we were eating before the diet, not more. Our metabolism uh, is lower and our hunger hormones are higher. So then we gain weight and it's kind of an endless cycle, unfortunately. It was protective 10,000 years ago. So truth number four, 
Prolonged dieting with severe calorie restriction leads to slower metabolism and increase in hunger hormones. Um, and now I'm going to pass it on uh, to Dr. Samreen. Thank you, Dr. Soka. Dr. Samreen, please uh, continue to enrich us. I'll just make a note. If anybody has any questions, please put them in the Q&A. Yes, thank you, Dr. Zoka. That was excellent. It's honestly hard to follow you. Uh, I'm going to share my screen. Can everyone see my screen? All right. So, um, so I am actually, sorry, we are going to go to myth number five. So myth number five is that bariatric surgery is dangerous and lots of people die from it. That couldn't be further from the truth. Um, here, the first evidence, um, you we have two tables on this slide. The first table on the top is um, showing complications after lap ruin by gastric bypass. And you can see that several studies again and again are showing that mortality rates are low and uh, other complications such as surgical site infections, um, thromboembolism, reoperations, bleeding. Um, these are all um, low, very low percentages. Um, when we start comparing it to other elective procedures, bariatric surgery is safe. Um, a, a lot of times I get patients in, um, in clinic who insist that, oh, they want sleeve because they heard that bypass, everyone who gets a bypass, they die. But we have good uh, data uh, to show our patients. Now, sleeve does remain the safest procedure and again is a um is a reason for us to know that bariatric surgery is safe you can look at the bottom table the risk of mortality is low it's um less than it's not even quarter of a percent um and when we're dealing with those kind of numbers it's it's hard to argue or say, oh, bariatric surgery is unsafe, or it will be, um, it will cause a, a life-threatening complication. Um, it is as safe as it gets in terms of elective surgery. So there's lots of studies, lots of data. Um, I put together a summary slide to put it all together. So when we are talking to patients, I think it's important to mention how transitioning from open to minimally invasive uh, surgery, first of all, really changed the landscape. And then um, I think MBSA QIP had a huge role to play in making bariatric surgery safe. The mortality rates now range at, from 0.03% to 0.2%. Again, this is less than quarter of a percent. This is as safe as it gets. When we start looking at serious adverse events across multiple studies, uh, what uh, we can see is that uh, it ranges, um, generally the risk of complications is less than 6%. Um, in uh, in Sleeve patients, it ranges from 0.8 to 5.6%. In bypass patients, slightly higher, uh, but still um, nowhere close to many other op uh, elective operations that are much more high risk than bariatric surgery. And then uh, as far as reoperation within 30 days is concerned, again, sleeve has less than 3% risk of reoperation for gastric bypass. And this is for all comers. For gastric bypass, less than 5%. Um, low rates of readmission overall. So it is safe to undergo bariatric surgery. Um, here is um, looking specifically at diabetic patients. These are sick patients. Um, and when we look at uh, all different, the, this uh, looks at eight different procedures um, that diabetic patients uh, could go through. And you can see that the mortality rate for a lap rubi gastric bypass is really low. And you can see it's actually lower than a lap coli. 
So uh, for me, two years ago, uh, it, this was really highlighted at our ASMBS uh, annual meeting, uh, where a keynote speaker also highlight, highlighted how we need to celebrate this as a win. We have standardized uh, bariatric surgery and made it so safe. So our truth number five is that primary bariatric surgery is as safe as getting a lap goalie and safer than getting an appendectomy because most appendectomies are not elective procedures. So our next myth is that bariatric surgery is a cosmetic procedure and has no health benefits. So important to highlight to our patients that we do not just weight loss surgery, but we're doing metabolic surgery. There is a lot of evidence showing that it has it has high, uh, undergoing bariatric surgery leads to high resolution rates of diabetes, hyperlipidemia, hypertriglyceridemia, hypertension and sleep apnea. And these are the big comorbidities, but even when we start thinking about things like pseudotumor cerebri, um, urinary incontinence, things that sometimes people don't even, um, and especially our uh, non-obesity uh, non surgeons or um, primary cares may not think about uh, those comorbidities. It's important to educate our primary cares about how um, other comorbidity, comorbidities that we don't conventionally think about can also be resolved with bariatric surgery. So taking a deeper dive into diabetes, um, STAMPI trial is a landmark uh, trial um, which randomized 150 patients with uh, morbid obesity and uh, had patients go through either intensive medical therapy or a combination of medical therapy with bariatric surgery. Uh, the endpoint was reduction in hemoglobin A1C they they found that uh, bariatric surgery with medical therapy was superior to medical therapy alone. Um, and the uh, results were durable uh, up to, uh, it looks, uh, the study looked at uh, five years data. Um, here you can see the reduction in hemoglobin A1C, slightly more with gastric bypass than with the sleeve, but definitely bariatric surgery more effective in a diabetes resolution. Um, this is a three-year follow-up, um, but even at five-year follow-up, this, these results are very convincing. And so um, when that's one study, but when you start looking at randomized control trials that look at, that are, uh, or at uh, 15 randomized control trials put together every single time surgery is favored in di for diabetes resolution. Uh, I think this is, this is undisputed that, uh, we are not just looking at weight loss by itself. So interestingly, our, our medical colleagues, the non-surgical colleagues started talking about this. Um, and uh, these, are, uh, these are some of the publications uh, in, um, in Diabetes Care uh, Journal um, from 2017. So in 2016, um, uh, um, there was a, a joint statement by international diabetes organizations. And I think the one thing that I, the, that I wanted to highlight here is the second uh, panel that you can see here, how they recommended bariatric surgery, even for patients um, with, from BMI 30 to 34.9. So this was recently now, ASMBS uh, had changed. Um, uh, we came up with, uh, with a change in guidelines, but back in 2016, our medical colleagues were already recommending uh, bariatric surgery for our diabetic patients. And even they said that even regardless of uh, uh, BMI values, uh, patients may, depending on certain factors, if they're of Asian descent, uh, descent or um, uh, based on their ancestry, family history, there may be a case for bariatric surgery even at lower BMIs. So since then, this um, uh, this has been um, the in, uh, 
the consensus statement has been adopted and endorsed by uh, multiple um, multiple societies and diabetes uh, organizations. The uh, the bottom line is for all um, diabetic patients, if they have um, obesity, then they need to be considered for bariatric surgery. You can see class three obesity, straight away surgery. Class two, um, uh, even with con uh, good control uh, with a lifestyle and a medical treatment, bariatric surgery should be considered. And patients with class one, if they have poor control, no brainer. Th that's the only um, class of patients that we currently say, okay, if they have good control, maybe hold off on bariatric surgery. So um, there is, um, and again, this this is worth um, have taking a separate read uh, by itself, but we know that there is um, a, a case for um, having different hormonal reasons why patients are um, uh, are uh, are having it's not just weight loss because the very next day and we all see this that we operate on a diabetic patient the very next day some patients are coming off their insulin then patients who are non-insulin dependent may not need any of their hypoglycemics the very next day so it's not from weight loss it's from the metabolic changes the hormonal changes um, that are happening and in the long term I, dr uh, zoka already spoke about the change in their microbiome as well so switching gears from diabetes to hypertension another landmark trial is the gateway trial um, where uh, the, again once again patients undergoing um, bariatric gastric bypass plus medical therapy versus medical therapy alone and you can see that um, surgery had uh, um, had a much better hypertension resolution than um, medical therapy alone. So those are comorbidities, but what about reduction in mortality? I think for me, what made the case um, um, that where I, I right away, where I made the decision that I want to be a um, bariatric surgeon was actually this, uh, uh, this study. When this came out, it created a lot of uh, waves. Uh, so prospective study, extremely good follow-up, 20-year follow-up of 99.9% uh, large patient group showing a decrease in mortality in patients undergoing bariatric surgery. Um, here, I uh, want to highlight um, how life expectancy, there is a, um, in unmatched uh, cohort or in risk, uh, unadjusted cohort, 2.4 uh, years um, uh, increase in um, their life expectancy in adjusted, sorry, going back to that, in adjusted uh, cohort, uh, three-year um, increase in, um, in life expectancy. So um, another study, more recent, looking at association between bariatric surgery and long-term survival. Um, this was a retrospective study. Uh, they uh, looked at the VA population. 74% um, uh, were men in this study. Um, and again, similar results. Increased life expectancy in patients undergoing bariatric surgery. So we know that this comorbidity resolution that goes with bariatric surgery also improves uh, patients' um, um, life expectancy. And so the truth number six is that bariatric surgery leads to significant improvement in metabolic and cardiac health and can add years to someone's uh, life. In the interest of time, I'll try to um, uh, go through the next um, two quickly since um, uh, we want to have enough time for questions. So myth number seven, bariatric surgery just makes the stomach smaller. And this is the primary mechanism behind weight loss. Again, this has already been touched upon, upon by Dr. Zoka. I've mentioned some, we won't go into uh, our um into a physiology class today, um, and uh, and I, I would not um, put you back to sleep this early in the morning with all the uh, all the details of every single hormone and their action. But we do know that there are hormonal changes inside the body 
uh, after bariatric surgery that changed the balance of satiety and hunger. And so um, the, again, um, uh, I'm going to um, skip that detail and Dr. Zoka already spoke with uh, about the changes in microbiome, but I think it's important for us to highlight um, to our other healthcare providers as, as well as our patients that bariatric surgery causes changes in hungers um, and satiety uh, hormones and the microbiome. So there are multiple ways wh why it works and it's not just cosmetic um, or works just by um, losing weight. And last but not the least, our myth number eight, that most people who get bariatric surgery regain all their weight. I think this is one of the um, or this is the second most common uh, myth that I see when I'm seeing patients in clinic. Um, I think the first most common is uh, the myth number five that we uh, we busted that um, patient that it's not that bariatric surgery is not safe. And this is the second most common that my patients worry about. Um, but when you look at uh, at data, um, uh, this uh, study right here is looking at a uh, lap adjusted gastric band and Rubai gastric bypass. Of course, um, we know and we won't go into details of gastric banding versus bypass today, but looking at three years after bariatric surgery among patients with severe obesity, you can see patients are maintaining their, uh, their weight. And then when you move up to um, 15 years, Based on our the Swedish trial, we uh, we had uh, the Swedish study that we re, uh, we mentioned earlier um, in the talk as well. You can see that there is there may be some weight regain, but these patients largely never go back to their original weight, and that is true for no matter what procedure patients are uh, are going through. So, control groups uh, when you're comparing surgery you can see the significant reduction in weight right there. And this is lasting for 20 years where we saw that it had great follow-up. The study had, um, it's a high, uh, high end and great follow-up. And we can see that surgery is uh, maintaining its results. So truth number eight is that bariatric surgery results in significant long-term weight loss. Um, so those were the four bariatric um, surgery related myths, but to put it all together, um, I think um, here's a, a good summary uh, slide for us to look at it all together. And I think it's a good time for questions. Thank you all so very much for that fantastic uh, presentation. I love hearing I took a screenshot of probably half the slides you guys sent. So really just appreciate um, the time you took. Sorry, I am getting back to a place with better Wi-Fi. Um, any, uh, if any questions um, come through, please feel free to put them in the Q&A and chat. I had one question that I wanted to ask both of you guys and see what you thought. Considering, um, um, you know, the myths related to calories in equals calories out, um, or that they don't, um, but in parallel, uh, marrying that with the concept that with bariatric surgery, we try to overhaul how people approach food and talk a lot about getting in protein and make sure they feel that they're getting the right nutrients. And really to, I actually think to keep them safe, how do you marry those, um, kind of those thoughts and, uh, balance it with your patients, especially trying to make sure that we understand, you know, treat the patient as somebody with a disease, because that can be a fine balance. And I'd be curious to hear your thoughts. You want to start? Like Dr. Zoka, go ahead. Oh, then... I think that's a great question. So part of me, and I don't want to open up a can of worms, but I personally think, yes, it is important for us to get protein. And I think the average person, even the average female bariatric patient who's not six foot five, 60 grams of protein a day is just fine. Um, I sometimes wonder whether our whole country is over obsessed with protein in a way that, you know, cause you can look at, I'm just going to pick Tom Brady is like a vegan 
and he's clearly an amazing athlete. So like the, the big challenge with all this protein is people think immediately, then I need to eat a lot of meat. And like, uh, I personally am a believer in more of a Mediterranean diet, meaning, you know, meat, less meat, uh, maybe some more fish. Um, when you look at people going to a fully plant-based diet, it is very healthy, uh, meaning less meat and dairy. But again, you know, I come from, I live in West Virginia. And uh, if you just, I, I don't think for a lot of people, you can start at like a plant-based diet. Um, so backing up to your question about the, you know, protein and supplements. Yes, I think they're, you know, the protein shakes and, and, and the processed protein foods are, can be a good tool for, you know, the diet progression progression, you know, after surgery where, you know, the first two weeks, they're probably on a full liquid diet. So those protein supplements can be helpful um, in the bars. But I personally think long term when people are back to the regular diet, you know, getting your protein from the food you eat. So I really think lentils are a good prebiotic food. Uh, lentils, chickpeas, um, again, I'm not saying don't eat meat, but in many cultures, meat is actually a condiment that flavors the food versus this whole big steak on a plate. And don't get me wrong, I enjoy a steak as much as everyone else. But when you look at the history of the American meat, potato and vegetable, uh, culturally, uh, this is kind of out there, but we had, you know, a, a huge melting pot of different cultures coming to America. And many of those people, whether they're from Eastern Europe, wherever, are cooking food in one big pot with, you know, meat, potatoes. It's like the crock pot meal. But somehow uh, this American culture of now you're in America and we eat a steak, a potato and meat it became actually a cultural sign to distinguish kind of like immigrant, maybe separate people like immigrant status from American. And I don't think that's a good thing. And I think that, you know, more melting pot eating of whole foods is probably healthier than having the steak potatoes and one little veggie. Yeah, I think, um, and I'm sorry, I'm sitting in a hotel um, uh, lobby side room where uh, the light keeps going off. I have to wave at it, make sure I'm still here. Um, so I really, uh, I think I completely agree with Dr. Zoka there. The How I tell my patients about calories in, calories out, first of all, nobody in, uh, unless someone's an athlete, nobody should be consuming 2000 calorie diet. And I think that's where, mis like I, I am very passionate about or, the American or against <laughs> American food industry. And I can, uh, I can do a whole uh, hour of talking about the American food industry. And some of it are factors that Dr. Zoka already mentioned, but also how we market food and we make patients think like they have to be consuming a 2000 calorie diet, but we are not, and that's not our lifestyle. That's not our metabolism. That's not what um, what most uh, of our patients need. So um, I think, um, I, first of all, um, based on our lifestyles, I mentioned to patients that piece um, that we don't have to be looking at calories, which Dr. Nova also busted that myth, uh, but also looking at macros. So we, I, I talk to them about looking at protein, carbs, and an unprocessed diet. Uh, I think, um, uh, Dr. Zoka, you uh, hit the nail on the head uh, there. It, I think as much as I tell patients, you don't, I don't want you on protein shakes for the rest of your life. It has to be a balanced diet and nobody can, if we keep thinking micromanaging diet for the rest of our lives, we, it's just not sustainable. So to keep it sustainable, you have to think about, I'm not limiting you from anything except like, I don't want them having, you know, 50 grams of sugar every day. So sugar is the only ingredient that I, um, I, and that I'm talking about, um, not the natural sugars in fruit, but I'm talking about uh, the processed sugar. 
other than that one thing, I don't think there's anything I tell patients not to have in the long term. Yeah, I, I think the the importance of whole foods. I, I'm as fast as I can get patients off protein shakes. I never recommend a protein bar. A protein bar is like the ultra ultra processed food. Um, exactly. Some of them are, you have to, if there are some like kind bars and like nut based bars that are a little bit overall better from a ingredient perspective. But I think the ultra processed food industry is a very interesting one to look at and more and more data continues to come out. Some of it from Kevin Hall that you guys brought up and some from other um, really interesting researchers in um, uh, the United Kingdom and Germany right now. Um there is a question in the chat that I wanted to get to uh, as weight regain is a long-term outcome of bariatric surgery uh, that I need to mention to my pre-op patients. Do you think it adds this uh, by bringing it up, even though it's not a majority of patients, it is a minority. Do you think bringing it up is a negative impact on patients' decision-making? It's a great question. I think we know maybe there's 15% of people who do have, you know, weight gain or failure of surgery. I don't think it's, uh, I think it's important to bring up the risks of weight regain. The big thing with that is choices on diet. So I really think bariatric surgery, I always reiterate to patients, is a tool. It's a tool that drives usually a one-year period of rapid weight loss, sometimes more for some people, sometimes less, but that most rapid weight loss is in the first six months. So we're really, I like people to be comfortable with bariatric style eating, you know, working on developing those habits in the pre-op period. So the three to six months before surgery, getting familiar with what that looks like, the smaller portion sizes, more frequent meals, healthier food choices, so that by the time they're at surgery, they don't need to learn any new habits. They just stick with the diet progression and get this first six month rapid weight loss benefit. From that point on though, you know, weight loss slows down and let's say at a year for a lot of people, it doesn't continue, then it's very important to make healthy eating choices. And so I think for everyone working with patients, really explaining the surgery is a tool, but it goes hand in hand with a healthier diet. And instead of saying it's not like dieting, it's a lifestyle. So changing your lifestyle to eat differently. And I think, you know, kind of a one more sentiment about these myths around obesity and uh, surgery, it's really important. Part of our job, you know, as surgeons is to be as technically safe as possible. But as physicians, our job is to teach, you know, other our community, wherever you work about, you know, uh, obesity myths and bariatric surgery myths and educate people to try and help people understand, you know, the best ways to be healthy. Yeah, no, but I was actually going to say, I think it's your friend. This can be your friend in a preoperative discussion, weight recurrence, who knew? But the same way patients are hesitant about getting a bypass because of dumping, right? And then when you sit down and you say, dumping is actually telling you that you're doing something that maybe isn't the healthiest thing for you. And you can amend your behaviors and you can adapt to avoid it. Same thing with weight recurrence. So I tell patients, you know, if you want to avoid weight recurrence, you absolutely can. And this is how we're going to do it. We're going to transition to whole foods. We're going to avoid the sugars. We're going to have some weight maintenance with exercise. These are all the behaviors that we can certainly put you in line and set you up for success to avoid that weight recurrence. I think that really gets patients into a good mindset preoperatively. Absolutely. Um, Nor the one thing I was going to add was, uh, it's interesting in my practice because um, my nurse practitioner has uh, a lot of contact with my patients as well. And now I start seeing a shift where patients were like, every patient was like, I want bypass because dumping is positive. I want, to, if I get dumping, then uh, I will I will not eat certain things. So now I'm trying to shift the balance back and be like, no, that's not the <laughs> message I wanted you to get. I do have one more question and then we'll wrap it up. Um, and this is for all of you. I, I know my thoughts on this, but we had Wegovi and now we have Manjaro. And in clinical trials, we have Reditrutide, which is for the fellows. So there's Wegovi is a GLP-1 agonist. Manjaro is a GLP-1 agonist with GIP. And then this last one has added a glucagon uh, element to it. And our weight loss is getting better and better and better better. Um, and I use these meds all the time. I know Shana does because she's the bomb. 
um, and has her obesity medicine certification, uh, which I've been meaning to do. And one day I will. Um, but so, you know, we use these meds and I think they're fantastic. And for me, uh, I will continue to use them. And I think they are going to augment my bariatric surgery population. I would love to think, to hear what your thoughts are on that sentiment. Um, I think that um, just because we uh, just, for example, diabetes or hy hypertension, it's we cannot be a one trick pony. So we need to have multiple uh, tricks um, or multiple tools in the toolbox. And so it all, I don't think it's going to take away surgery. It will make the management of the disease of obesity better. And yes, we may move away from uh, from operating on patients that are BMI 35, possibly maybe even BMI 40. But unfortunately, we have a, the rates of obesity are going up a B, um, the rates of morbid obesity are going up as well. So the higher BMI patients will need multi, um, like multiple, those multiple tools. And it will not be just one thing. It's not just surgery alone. It's not just medication alone. I think we will continue to, we'll just get better at the treatment of obesity is my take on it. I think, yeah, agree. They're, they're an adjunct and can be a primary therapy for a lot of people at lower BMI numbers. What I'm waiting for, though, is I looked, there's 26-week data uh, out, but I have not seen the 52-week data, one in, you know, two and three-year data on these medications. And I personally predict the cheddar man, our cheddar man brains are probably going to foil these in some way. So uh, I'm going to think, I personally think there'll be a 30% failure rate of these. And at that point, um, oh, good. Eckhouse thinks it's going to be more. Um, well, it's when you stop them, the recidivism rates are yeah. 60% right now. And there is a 10% average, depending on the med right now, uh, uh, of people not responding. Yeah. So. so I think they're a great opportunity, though, for people to get their head into the what are my tools to treat obesity space? And if they fail these medications, it can be a pathway to encourage bariatric surgery. But we, I agree, there's some great data at ASMBS that show people who were on the GLPs before surgery and stopped at the time of surgery lost more weight than people who weren't. So, you know, they're here to stay. I think also from a cost effectiveness standpoint, insurance companies are certainly going to see if I keep somebody on a lifetime's worth of these medications versus a sleeve or a Sadie or a gastric bypass, what is, what is the cost benefit for me? Um, and I really think that surgery is going to end up being way more cost effective long-term. One mm -hmm. last question. Unfortunately, we only have time for one more. I think this is pretty easy to address. And I think you would all agree with me. Somebody said, Hey, should we be screening for ADHD? Um, and I think we do. Uh, my patients, this is, a, this is a very important point. My patients all see a weight loss psychologist preoperative. Right. And that is what they do. They suss out all of the things that may lead to issues after surgery. And I think that's a really important point because there are a lot of, you know, telehealth services and um, other means of screening out there. So you just need to make sure that whoever your provider is, it's doing your cycle logical screen is actually familiar with weight loss surgeries, familiar with the comorbidities and the changes that come in mental health after as you lose vast amounts of estrogen and, and moods change and mental health changes. Um, I think that's a really important part of the workup for these patients. All right. Well, thank you guys so very much. We are over our time for today. We had a really great discussion. Really appreciate um, uh, both of y'all's, uh, fantastic comments. Um, again, love my screenshots. I'll be full using them, uh, to help t uh, teach this in the future. Uh, Dr. Jane Spangler. I just think that was a masterclass on the literature. Um, fellows go out and read these papers. They just gave you a phenomenal review of a lot of what our field, uh, is about, but I think that reading these papers is still important too. Uh, Nova, Sarah, thank you so much. That was really an excellent talk and we appreciate your expertise. 
have a couple questions in the Q and A. Uh, so I would invite you guys, if you have any questions at this point, um, to start posting them in the chat or put them in the Q and A, and we can get started. Uh, so, Dr. Sharif, do you want to um, go ahead with the first question? Sure. Can you guys hear me? Hi. The first question uh, was, uh, does the surgery play a role in genetic and cause obesity? And does diet control uh, alone can be successful with them when to refer patients to genetic uh, testing? So genetic play, I mean, uh, um, uh, as you know, uh, Julie, genetics plays a huge role. 70% of uh, obesity can be accounted for genetics. And um, in terms of obesity, there are two major kinds. And I would ask uh, the fellow to refer to the genetics talk. There is monogenic uh, obesity and a polygenic one. In monogenic, you have one genes that's missing and that leads to childhood obesity, which is pretty severe. And the polygenic one would be where you have some deletion of some alleles or it, it, it involves more in terms of epigenetics. And there is a role for genetic testing, but I would say the majority of it would be in childhood obesity. Uh, in my practice, we I don't send them for genetic testing. I don't know what you have to say. No, I don't usually send patients, but I, I agree with you. I mean, I think we we typically see the monogenic in uh, patients who have early onset obesity. Uh, typically, by the time those patients come to our office, they've already been through seeing the pediatrician or seeing right. the endocrinologist, and you know they've had an appropriate workup. But if a patient gets to your office and and that has not um, happened, then I would definitely um, uh, have them see genetics. That's awesome. Um, the next question, I actually, Dr. Soka is here. Hi. <laughs> there, guys. Sorry. Okay. Thanks for coming on. Um, we were just starting with the Q&A. Um, I don't know if you wanted to comment on the, the first question that popped up about um, when do you normally refer patients to get genetic testing for obesity? I mean, almost never. So I personally think, you know, syndromic obesity, usually people with, you know, Prater Willie or, or those sort of things, they've already been diagnosed. Um, I can probably think of in the, you know, seven ish years I've been in West Virginia, maybe referring one patient uh, during that time. So I, um, you know, as you guys are going through all of the myths, I had a couple of questions while people are still posting. Um, sure. I thought maybe we could talk about um, when you're seeing a patient in clinic, uh, and let's say they've gone through and they've already had bariatric surgery, and now they've presented to you as a weight recurrence. How do you normally counsel them, especially in light of the data that you showed us about um, diet and exercise? Because typically we've learned that, you know, diet and exercise is really the mainstay of of um, of health maintenance. Like, what do you what do you tell these patients? Yeah, I think. And would this be specifically in the scenario of weight recurrence or? like GERD post sleeve? Uh, I guess you can look at both. I, I know my question yeah. was very specific. Uh, you can yeah. respond however you feel. Yeah, I mean, I so our practice is interesting. We do, we do, I mean, West Virginia is number one in obesity in the US and we do a lot of primary bariatric surgery. We also get referred a lot of people who have, have issues However, we, we have not kind of due to resources of our program done a lot with revisions of surgical revision of gastric bypass. I think the one with the most data is limb lengthening. So, you know, lengthening usually the BP limb, 100 centimeters or so. And technically it's not a hard operation, but I think the biggest challenge we have is resources because if you take someone... Let's let's just go with this example. Who has weight regain after a bypass? Um, you, you know, option option one is is basically getting them back on track with lifestyle things first. You know, so uh, eating habits, choices, 
Now I think medications such as the GLP ones are another tool. So kind of pharmacotherapy for weight regain. When we talk about interventions, some people do the stoma reduction or the pouch reduction. We have advanced GI practitioners here, but at least in West Virginia, they're often not covered. So they would be an out of pocket expense anywhere from like six to 10 grand. And to me to restore restriction, I don't, I don't think that's always the best thing if people aren't making healthy eating habits to begin with. So that's sort of the endoscopic intervention and then revision. So revision, limb lengthening, um, but then, you know, bigger revision. So what reversing the bypass into like a duodenal switch. But I, I feel like uh, sometimes people who fail as in regain all their weight with surgery clearly may not be making good eating habit choices. And so kind of setting them up like, oh, we can save them with another surgery isn't helpful. Um, and that's where really getting back to basics in terms of we have them meet with our dietitians and go over kind of the the basic, uh, the basic, you know, bariatric principles. One thing we see here a lot is just buying takeout food, right? I mean, we all rush around and I think lack of meal prep for our entire culture is a problem because we're all stressed. We all, or even that thing where it's lunch, someone wants to order out at work. And so then you're like, yeah, of course I want to eat my Panera, Jimmy John's pizza, whatever. But all those portion sizes when we order out are two or three times what we need. Um, and I feel like people cheat a lot at work on diet stuff, myself included. Um, so that, yeah, so that would be the scenario. But I do think uh, basically more medical weight loss is appropriate for people with weight regain. Um, the hard part, though, is the people with sleeve, you know, GERD post sleeve, which is the bane of all our existence. And uh, those people, you know, usually need to repeat a bariatric pathway. And I try to encourage them to really start making, uh, you know, some progress toward a, a weight loss goal that's usually based on where they're starting with. So anywhere between 10 and 30 pounds before surgery, because we know the bypass you know, for sleeves, some people have really good weight loss data, but we see here, um, you know, people's GERD improves greatly, but the weight loss, if you use the standard limb lengths of like 50 BP, 150 RU, the weight loss still isn't great. And I know um, Dr. Nameri has some good algorithms for, um, he, I think, makes 175 centimeter RU limb. I mean, pardon me, BP limb. Mm -hmm. And then shorter um rule limb and we've kind of started lengthening our uh our bp limbs but we haven't jumped to the full numeri protocol yet i would just uh, that was an awesome awesome uh, uh, uh summary of uh, how to approach a patient with uh weight recurrence just i uh, wanted to add one more thing to that like when i see these patients in the office, I think the most important thing is taking a detailed history, like kind of figuring out when they started gaining weight. And often if you look deep enough, there is some alcohol involved there. I uh, Quite a few, at least 50% of the time, patients have uh, started consuming more liquid calories. And that's kind of something that can be fixed easily. So, Yeah, I think the biggest thing from a system standpoint for all of us is to try and have a supportive environment for people right? because really you want to catch people when they're at, I don't know, before they regain all their weight, you know, before they, uh, you know, usually we look at like it, three or six months if they're excess weight, you know, we like to see usually 40% excess weight loss between three and six months. And so if they're starting to fall off that curve, I think it's important to jump in there because I, I have a few patients where they they basically regained all their weight and they they didn't come to follow up until the point where they had regained all their weight, and which isn't good. Yeah, I think it's hard sometimes with, you know, that patient population with bariatric patients um, to get them to keep coming back to their appointments. Um, probably across the board, I would say, if you have a follow-up rate that's in the 60s or above, 60% or above, you're probably doing really, really well. 
I think sometimes there are socioeconomic factors. Um, sometimes patients don't really realize that, as you mentioned before, obesity is a chronic disease. So it's not something that just gets treated with the surgery. Um, and and you just move on from it. And somehow the surgery is a, is a, like a magic pill, you know, just like you were busting that first myth. So I think that's important to stress to them to keep uh, continuing with their follow-up. Uh, so we have another question in the chat. Um, how do you select patients for the different surgical procedures? Like how do you distinguish between patients who are good candidates for sleeve versus bypass versus CD? Yeah. And do, do either of you, what's your practice for Sadie DS? Because it's something we're just trying to build in to our West Virginia home. Yeah. Um, yeah. So in my practice, I would say primarily sleeve is what we do. Most patients come in wanting the sleeve and it's very difficult sometimes to talk them out of it. Um, yeah. The next common I do is the bypass. And then we, we just have a smattering of, of Sadie patients right now or DS patients. Um, and that's not necessarily how I, like if I wanted to design my own practice, how I think it would be ideal. Um, mm -hmm. I think the Sadie's a great operation and it should be performed in a lot more patients than we're doing yeah. right now. And are you getting insurance coverage? So that's, yeah, <laughs> that's actually one of the limitations why we're not performing it as much. As, yeah. The issues with insurance, but how about yeah. you guys? Yeah, I mean, we're just, we've probably done between the three surgeons less than seven, just, you know, mostly more DS and maybe one Sadie because of insurance. I think we would love to do Sadie just because it's a little simpler, uh, but it seems like DS is, we're getting a little more uh, approvals that way. But yeah, going back to your question, how do we choose? Um, I mean, I, number one, I, I really do think the bypass is like a pretty great operation only for the experience we have here with GERD post sleeve. So I would say about 10% of people who get sleeves are going to have pathologic GERD, even if the sleeve is perfect. And that means, you know, 10 revisions. And we see that when you look at the MBS equip numbers, uh, 2013 and 14 is when the sleeve overtook the bypass in popularity nationally. And that's when the revision rate started going up. And now we're on to 15% revisions. And, you know, in 2015, when I started, the main revision was taking out a band and, you know, doing a sleeve or a bypass. And now the main revision is sleeve mm -hmm. with third getting a bypass. And I would say right now it's probably 50% of our own practice and then 50% of people who come from elsewhere. Um, with that issue. So I hate GERD post sleeve. Um, and my main goal is to really select my patients carefully for sleeve. So, uh, you know, if they have really poorly controlled acid reflux, meaning they have, they're on a PPI, maybe daily or BID and an H2 blocker, and they're still having symptoms, I don't recommend a sleeve. Um, when I scope them uh, preoperatively and I see a lot of bile in their stomach, like bile reflux, I also think bile reflux is the enemy of the sleeve because that is really not going to change. Uh, and then you're just making a tiny little sleeve and that bile is going to shoot up. So like non-acid reflux. However, for bypass, again, we have a pretty hard stop. West Virginia is number one in tobacco too. So if people are chewing tobacco, um, vape, smoking on the visit or they stop when they hear our information session two weeks before if they say oh i just quit two weeks ago after you heard the info information session no we don't do bypass on any of those people also people using a lot of NSAIDs and you know people who are unsure they're going to be able to really commit to stopping the NSAIDs usually people with rheumatoid arthritis when they're on all those mab medications like for immunomodulation again probably not getting a bypass. So, you know, it, it seems like people kind of self-select into either category, but I, I will say, you know, in terms of just weight loss consistency, usually I think the bypass is slightly stronger and even the post-op recovery, people tend to have a lot less nausea after a bypass. So, I mean, my practice has swung from being maybe eight sleeves and two bypasses now to probably six sleeves and four bypasses. And we would, again, love to do the DS, but I do think healthcare literacy plays into it. And like I tell people, I think of the sleeve as a crappy rental car. I mean, not crappy, but you can drive it around Vegas, return it on empty tank, and you're still going to be okay. 
The bypass is like a BMW. You really do need to take it to get the oil changes and the, the checkups. And then a DS is a Lamborghini. And I will say I don't meet that many people at my first clinic visit who are ready to take care of a Lamborghini. However, there are some. How about you, Dr. Sharif? So very similar to what Dr. Zuka has just said, um, I think uh, uh, patients self-select. So the things that I want to know is absolutely acid reflux. Smoking is a hot, hot stop for bypass. But I am a pro-bypass person exactly for all the reasons you have said. I feel like the patients recover better. The weight loss is very consistent. Uh, again, if I have a feeling that these patients are not going to fall up, then I lead a, a little towards the sleeve. But... Being in Pennsylvania, I see a lot of patients with a BMI greater than 55. So now I'm beginning to offer them a SADI and DS procedure. The way I decide SADI versus DS is purely based on insurance. Like if their insurance covers a SADI procedure, great, which is very rare. Uh, but then our personal, uh, uh, like the health system uh, insurance does cover them. So those patients do get series. Uh, in terms of DS, uh, again, the limb lens, what I do is make them shorter. The rule limb is 50 and then uh, the, beep, uh, the common channel is at least 300 or 350. So uh, that's something that I've seen. But again, uh, patient literacy really does play a role because they've seen someone, they've heard something. So they kind of have these notions and that's why we need to break those myths. Uh, that, that that it kind of involves uh, not just patient education, but also I think what PCPs tell them. They, I don't know if you guys face this, but then PCP thinks bypass are bad, bad surgeries. And uh, that is a big notion that I keep fighting against. Like who, why? You had one patient that had something wrong. And uh, again, that's that's been my challenge here. Yeah, I you know, I don't think we have that necessarily, but I think you bring up a great point about super obesity and where do we go with that? Because I would say the the interesting conversation is exactly what you said, the BMI of kind of 55 and above, because we know that on average, a bypass takes 15 BMI points, takes the BMI yeah, 15 yeah. points, the sleeve 12 points down. So people with super obesity, let's just say the, the, the BMI of 55 if they get a bypass after surgery, they will be down to a BMI of 40, but that's still with obesity as a disease and all the path, the pathologic things that happen with it. So my, I tend to think number one, for people with super obesity, BMI 55 and above, a sleeve may be a better starting point, a sleeve or Sadie uh, DS, or I've been trying to encourage, you know, a lot of people, we do uh, encourage people to lose weight based on where their starting BMI is. So like a BMI of like 40 to 45 loses about 10 pounds. And then a BMI of 70 loses about 50 to 60 pounds before surgery. So for those people with the BMI of 55, you know, I encourage them, usually their weight loss goal is between 25 and 35 pounds. If they can meet that, they can usually bring their BMI down to about, you know, 53 uh, you know, with the weight loss goal and then, you know, a pre-op liquid diet, it can get down to about 50. And then they're sort of in the range where a bypass can can help them a little bit more. Um, but I think super obesity is challenging. I also meet, you know, these younger folks, maybe they're 20 uh, with super obesity. For that, I would say, you know, a sleeve is a perfect starting point just because obesity is a chronic disease. Where is it? Yeah, in like 20 years, are they going to need that second stage at that point? I had a question for the panel. Um, now, I have had quite a few colleagues of mine come and talk to me about how do we approach uh, patients with obesity? They feel that it's not their job. The myth is uh, if you have a weight problem, then the bariatric surgeon or the uh, you know obesity medicine people have to deal with this. How do you guys counter or how do you uh, educate your, your personal colleagues? These can be surgeons, these can be medical doctors. Uh, they feel they're very uncomfortable dealing with this. Yeah, it's funny you mentioned that because I actually was going to ask something very similar. <laughs> um, I think the responsibility is partially on us to educate our colleagues. Um, I do spend a fair bit of time talking with the medical students. Um, so, you know, 
I teach, I lecture them and I'll sit in the operating room. Um, and that's a big focus for me to try to get them at the medical stu student level so they understand that this is a conversation that they can initiate with their patients. It doesn't matter what field they end up in, right? Even orthopedic surgeons are talking to their patients about obesity. Um, I do like what you had said in your talk, Dr. Zoka, about um, asking for the patient's permission to even initiate the conversation. It's something very simple. I think any provider can, can well, any physician can probably start the conversation or any PA or uh, APP can start the conversation as long as the patient feels comfortable talking about it. Yeah, I think this is for even our society, ASMBS, like really uh, finding a way to do more outreach with primary care organizations um, to educate people about kind of the challenges of medical weight loss, the value of bariatric surgery or metabolic surgery, and also people, everyone in their own institution doing that. So I think simple things like offering to do, you know, grand rounds about it for the internal medicine department, the uh, primary care department. Uh, but I like your idea of getting them, the medical students engaged as well. So we are um, over time, um, but I do want us to get to one more question in the chat. Um, it's asking, how do you approach screening or treating vitamin deficiencies and malabsorption in your bypass and DS patients? Yeah, so we have a pretty standard protocol for specifically the bypass, you know, or for our program, everyone gets nutritional labs at three months and then also at 12 months and annually. And so uh, that's what we do, the screening for the sleeve and the bypass. For the DS, um, I think I'd defer to you guys in terms of screening. I know we are uh, looking at getting more frequent labs because of the higher risk of my micronutrient deficiency, but what do you do? So, so where's Sorry, uh, you go. Uh, no, 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 you go ahead. Uh, so we usually screen patients, you know, um, before surgery, but then after surgery, we're checking labs every three months on the DS patients. It is a little onerous, honestly, um, but I think this is a high-risk population. And if you are a patient who wants to have the DS, you have to commit to the level of um, close monitoring that's required. Um, so we do talk to patients about that ahead of time. Um, I think having it a little bit more frequently at three months, it, it allows us to identify problems more frequently and or um, earlier and then address them as soon as possible. Uh, we don't have any patients right now going out past a year with the Sadie DS, uh, but I imagine we'll probably have them coming in every six months for, for visits as well. And there's a nice, actually on the ASMBS website, there's a toolkit that talks about a vitamin screening in a paper and it provides some good cutoff values because you'll see, I know we just had this discussion with our group that vitamin A Deficiency sometimes is defined as 30 versus 20. Right. And uh, it's it's a hard thing to treat because you can overdose on vitamin A, but ASMBS recommends using the number 30. Uh, so it just helped us uh, with not over, over screening and over treating. Right. So very similar, uh, very quickly uh, to what Dr. Uh, uh, Lloyd said, uh, with CDDS, it's every three months and with uh, bypass and sleeves it's six months and a year and yearly afterwards but I, I agree with you with DS I think at least every six months yeah. is what we we should check and the only other thing is uh, if a patient comes to the emergency department no matter where they had the surgery done we always get the B1 and B12 at least an iron and folate kind of uh, checkup done uh, on them so another very and quick and the thymine right sorry you're also giving them giving them thymine when they come in oh absolutely yeah. uh, it's like yeah they, they all get their thymine injections if they come in. Yeah. Great, great. Um, well, I would love to continue the conversation. I think we could probably talk for another hour or so, but we're okay. over time. Um, so, so thank you again to uh, both of our presenters, but especially to Dr. Soka for coming back for the afternoon session. And um, we'll have another fellow um, project lecture the first Friday of next month. Uh, in the interim, we'll also be having a bariatric happy hour. Uh, this is on the fourth Thursday uh, of this month, and our presenter will be Dr. Omar Ghanem. He will be talking about reversal of gastric bypass, which might be something that um, fellows don't get to see a lot in their fellowships. I think this will be a good session for you guys to watch some videos and learn about some technical uh, tips.
All right. Again, thank you guys. Thank you so much. Right, to thank you. So thank you guys enjoy weekend. Bye.